Hello, and welcome to the Supply Chain Master Series, What's Fueling Summer Freight? I am Roquita Coleman-Williams, Director of Intermodal Business Development at Coyote, and I'm excited to be joined with these three other experts at Intermodal Shipping. It's certainly been an interesting couple of years in all modes of shipping in every facet of the supply chain, and Intermodal certainly has not been an exception. I'm excited to get into some of the conditions influencing the industry over the past couple of years, where we're at today, and where things headed so that you can plan your supply chain. Let's meet our panelists. Elise Ghosh, Assistant Vice President of Intermodal Sales for Union Pacific Railroad. Good morning, Elise. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Jeff Smock, Assistant Vice President of Sales and Marketing for COFC Logistics. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning, Roquita, and thank you. And Luke Simondinger, Vice President of Intermodal Coyote Logistics. Good morning, Luke. Good morning. Thanks for having me. As I mentioned, Intermodal has been really hard hit with supply chain issues over the past couple of years, from trashy shortages to port congestion. So I'd like to just take a few minutes to recap what's happened so we have some context for what we're doing today. Luke, what was the state of the industry heading into the pandemic? I think uh, if everyone kind of runs their memories back, we were coming off of a really soft uh, peak season. Uh, the industry had uh, seen demand uh, taper off. Um, I, I think some folks even asked where peak was. Um, but we were in a, in a situation where I think all, all providers were really looking for uh, demand in the marketplace um, and working with their partners to make sure that we were uh, generating increased demand for intermodal business. At least for Union, Union Pacific specifically, you guys saw a very strong 2018 in terms of shipments, demand and consumer spending. But then the transportation market saw a dip in 2019. What did you learn from this? You know, great question. Luke mentioned it. You went from kind of a 2018 was super high. People were out investing, getting containers. Get, hey, it's going to be great. And then 2019 felt like it fell off the cliff of everybody living it. And so what we learned there is kind of you got to be agile. You got to you got to you got to pivot quickly and you got to keep your eye close to the customers. The customers at Union Pacific, we work with intermediaries and then it's the beneficial owner after that. And so you have to keep your ear to the ground and listen to our customers. So as we headed into 2020, the pandemic being that kind of volume variable, agile and listen to our customers really um, meant a lot because, you know, again, going back and thinking through those those first planning sessions, we're used to planning things in, in two year horizons and we were planning in two day horizons, two week horizons when we entered the pandemic. And so, um, you know, great lessons to be learned and, and uh, we're implementing those now and continue to be agile and listen to our customers today. And what happened from a pricing and capacity perspective? Yeah. And, you know, we saw rates um, go from highs of 18 to lows of 2019 and then immediately shoot back up, uh, you know, in kind of that April time frame, Union Pacific, we track our seven day car loadings. Um, and in 2020, it just it went down from the height of 187 uh, seven day car loadings down to the lows of 119. Um, pricing did the same thing. And then within a matter of two months, we shot back up to kind of a 160. And then we saw just the gamut in trucking, intermodal, um, ocean carrier freight um, explode. I think the best example you can say is kind of getting a box from uh, China to Chicago went as low as 1500 to as high as 15,000 in that exact time frame. So that does a lot of havoc to uh, capacity. It does a lot of havoc to planners and procurement teams. Um, and everybody was living that together. Luke, your perspective, what happened to pricing and capacity? I, it followed the exact trend that Elise just mentioned. And I think what became prevalent was any procurement strategy you had in place up to that point kind of went out the window in a sense. And I think that was, uh, you know, skew based as much as it was uh, transportation based. So, you know, the folks that we work with at, at all of our customers were scrambling because things that weren't prioritized or, or identified to be high um, sensitivity in terms of transit suddenly became that. And so the, the supply chain where they were sourcing transportation from previously really shifted, whether it was an inter international or domestic shipment, 
Um, so not only was it uh, volatility in price, it was on a lot of OD pairs that weren't necessarily seeing different uh, expedited transit needs and, and that they had in the past. I've heard a number of leaders say that the pandemic has elevated our shared purpose, uh, especially for logisticians, some of the logisticians here this morning. At least mentioned agility. One of the other areas is around keeping a focus on the voice of the customer. What are some of the other evolutions that you've seen through 2020 and 2021 in the industry? You know, I think, um, you know, I sit back, I think we, we all joke, we all sharing, you know, drinks at a happy hour. We're like, hey, people know what we do now. <laughs> this is so great. <laughs> um, for years, I was just kind of this hidden, uh, silent, uh, very necessary thing to our economy, but nobody really understood it. Um, everybody knows what we do. That's, that's good. And that's um, and that's a lot of lot of pressure, right? Um, on the good side, it's bringing in new ideas, new talent, new technology, and that will that will be great for our um, you know our industry and our our customers and our economy. Um, so new blood, new talent, great. Uh, the other thing, again, as I mentioned, is technology, and the and doubling down on the fact that visibility is key. When you this is a relay race, and and. Sometimes it's the ocean care, the next it's the Drake care, then it's the railroad, then it's the final Drake carry at the end. And finally we get to the customer. Everybody, when they hold that baton, it's their turn to run as fast as they can and communicate it up and down the chain. And when you don't have that uh, communication patterns or visibility or the technology to make that fast and efficient and real time, um, you know, we're, it, it's not good. So uh, I'm really excited to see the technology that we're investing in at Union Pacific. But more than that, what we're doing collectively um, to share that data, I think that will will be a really good um, improvement that's been needed for a while, um, and it's getting accelerated. Luke, how has this been different or similar for the truckload space? You know, I, I think about, again, the, the individual customer and, and their ability to rely on their providers uh, to make sure not only is there visibility, but as Elise just mentioned, a high level of communication on exceptions. And at a certain point, everything was an exception. And so uh, any provider that can really group those together, provide consistent updates and then solutions for uh, what those impacts may be. Um, a lot of times in the situations we were was finding product further up in the supply chain and creating a solution to bypass something that might be stuck because there was just no option of, of expediting it from its current state. So, you know, those solutions um, got implemented on the fly, refined. It was all embedded in communication. Um, and that, that goes between the, you know, whether you're an LSP or, or an underlying service providers and, and the customers, you know, those, those groups got tighter in terms of their communication. Um, I think there was more transparency in, in what issues were being had. And, you know, that goes from the customer having labor challenges on their docks, uh, resulting in equipment sitting loaded at their facilities um, to the to the terminals that were having similar labor, labor challenges. I think it's uh, easy to forget how challenged we were uh, to walk into a day and have had a close contact event that took 25, 30 percent of your workforce out of play for the next seven days and having to play around that. Um, it meant as a provider, finding a systemic uh, solution that might be creative and actually making that something you can repeatedly do on a go forward basis, because tomorrow's challenge, you're going to have to do the same thing. Um, so a lot of resilience within the team, but it's all embedded in communication. And, and Elise mentioned 2018 and 2019, what the what the market looked like. But as we moved into 2021, U.S. business logistics cost rose 22.4 percent to nearly 1.8 five trillion dollars, which represents eight percent of the 2021 to 23 trillion in GDP. What changes did you see driven from that alone? Yeah, I think I go ahead. Elise. Go ahead you go ahead. No, I, I and you know, I think this is probably going to lead into maybe what you had to, to mention here, Elise. But, you know, conversely, we saw no end in sight with regard to peak. You know, we, we came out of the end of the year. Uh, volumes didn't wane at all. Um, the congestion and um, I, I think choke points that we were seeing, whether it was ships at, at anchor or specific terminals inland uh, experiencing challenges, just got exasperated by a, a, a really challenging winter. Um, I know the Union Pacific was uh, very challenged across the network and ultimately had to kind of shut down for a couple of days to get things to reset and get the operations back up and running. 
um, at the time wasn't very excited about it, but understood. And I would say other part, other rail partners we had didn't take as aggressive an action. And those issues kind of drained them throughout the balance of the year and into the start of this year. So what we saw was just a, a tremendous amount of congestion across the entire network. And then that got exasperated by, you know, seasonality as well as continued um, impact to the workforce throughout the network. Elise? Your perspective on the changes that that you've seen that's been driven out of that? Yeah, I think um, the one thing I guess I'd add different, you hit it right on the head, Luke, on kind of what happened, what we did and how we had to make swift action. And it's not fun, but it's for the overall health of the entire network that you have to make those decisions. Um, you know, but we saw this shift of um, and it's, it's just human nature, right? I, this isn't working, so let me try the next thing. Um, and that came through in, hey, I normally come into LA Long Beach, but now I'm gonna go to Houston. Oh, I normally did Houston, now let me come into the Port of Virginia. And that's just, that's great ingenuity and creativity, but when your infrastructure is built and your chassis are here and your drivers are here, shifting that is, is a longer term um, scenario than as fast as you can make that decision mentally. And so what we find and found is when typically you'd see a third of your business in LA Long Beach getting consumed locally, mm -hmm. a third of your business going and transloading into the domestic container, and then a third of your business staying intact into an international container, that's what the infrastructure is built around. And overnight that flipped and people were saying, I can't get here, I'm seeing bad pictures in Chicago, I'm gonna outsmart that and I'm gonna, I'm gonna flip it to transload. Well, then we overnight, everybody made that shift in fourth quarter 2021 and the IPI, excuse me, Inland Point Intermodal and just tanked down 26, 20, 30%. Then the domestic shippers um, and intermodal providers were then dumped, if you will, with all this freight that their infrastructure, their chassis pools weren't ready for. And so we saw that we're finding that normalize a little bit right now. Mm -hmm. um, but I think those are the things that we all saw together and, and felt and had to, again, be agile with seeing this shift. And how do we how do we help um, all everybody in the supply chain find a solution for how we get the freight to market? Right. So it, there's a little bit. How do we meet the needs? But how do we educate everybody that wants to get their product to market on what the infrastructure is built for and is ready to handle? OK. Well, that catches us up on the past. I'd like to transition to the present. Relative stability may or may not return, so the logistics se sector must invest now in controlling what factors it can. Let's talk about what that means for the current trends related to equipment, drivers, rail priorities, and global supply chains. Mm -hmm. Jeff, as it relates to equipment specific to chassis situations, tell us what you're saying. Certainly, thank you, Raquita. Uh, COFC Logistics uses the DCLI 53-foot chassis pool within the BNSF network. Uh, our containers are only uh, running on BNSF. The DCLI has ordered 40,000 chassis. Roughly, they've delivered 9,000 year to date uh, and continue to expect to add 2,500 to 4,000 uh, each month across all of their DCLI rail pool locations, which includes uh, most of the class one railroads. Um, the, I think what contributes sometimes to the deficit chassis situation that we see from, from day to day in each different market is the availability uh, is negatively impacted, unfortunately, when shippers and consignees have labor shortages and or trucking community shortages of drivers. If this leads to extended dwell, both at a shipping dock and a receiving dock. And so that creates a tightness on the chassis supply, uh, certainly across the most of the class one railroad scenarios. And what's the chassis situation from your perspective, Elise? Yeah, I'd echo a lot of what Jeff, Jeff said. Um, we also, you know, have decisions. Um, and anytime you are an asset owner, you have to think through, and, and you see the stats that say, gosh, if we could just eke out 0.1 day of improvement, we could generate 400 chassis. So you're you're, you're hoping and praying, is the, is the labor situation going to get any better? But at a certain point, you're putting your head in the sand if you're not addressing it. And so at Union Pacific, we looked at this as a longer term situation. It's not that any of our shippers really want it to take this long either. Nobody wants this. This all happened to all of us. 
and we have to make the choice to either act or you know sit back and wait we acted and same thing just like jeff mentioned we went out and uh, uh secured 5600 chassis um made that decision and it was a tough decision to make last year when you didn't really know what was going to happen or not and things were probably three three x the price but it was still the right decision to go out there to make sure that we have chassis to put under our containers we knew that customers wanted to ship intermodal um you know the the value proposition of rail and the sustainability and the value you get from an intermodal product while we still need to improve our our performance the value proposition is still strong in there and it will continue to be there so it's the right thing to do so we have 5600 that we made the decision to make last year they're just starting to come online we have about 2000 of those now um, the remainder should be coming here before peak. Um, what does peak mean anymore though? <laughs> but uh, uh, we are hoping to have them here and under our containers so we can get our containers that have been stacked on our, our EMP UMAX fleet that we manage at Union Pacific um, out and uh, available for customers to ship more intermodal, which we know they want to do. Absolutely. And and to be honest, when you make when you keep the voice of the customer as a priority, it does make those businesses, even the toughest business decisions, a little bit easier to make. Yep. Yep. Tell us what's going on in the flat car situation. So on the flat car situation, um, you know, I'd liken it to on those chassis. We really need every shipper out there. Everybody look at see what you can do to eke out that improvement on the street. Now, we as the railroads and the rail industry owe the turn times on the flat cars. And speaking just for Union Pacific, we know we're not where we want to be. We know we're not where our customers want us to be on our velocity. Um, Luke mentioned it earlier. We had to make a very difficult decision during the kind of the February time frame last year to say the network isn't healthy. Stop, pause, resuscitate. Let's go. Uh, Union Pacific had to make a similar situation. Um, this is more on a really our manifest business is what we were finding and seeing that our over the road velocity was starting to come to a halt. Our car load inventories were then therefore rising. And just like a, you know, pile up on the Eisenhower, um, you know, that continues to grow and you've got to just pause and not have any more containers, just or any more cars on the road. We didn't need any more cars. So we had to make the difficult decision to tell everybody collectively, pause, let's do a pause. If you really want to ship 100, can you just do 50 this week? And if we can pause and make a stop here, we can get the entire network spinning up faster. So in April, we went out to our customers really overall, again, more on our manifest side um, and our bulk side and said, you know, can we work collaboratively to do this? And what's in it for all of us together is that we can get the network healthy and come back just like we did in the, in the winter polar vortex of 2021. So we are seeing the fruits of our labor. Um, our operating inventory is going down from the highest high of over 200,000 uh, cars of inventory to now in that 184, 185 range, 185,000. And then more importantly, the velocity. Um, our velocity has improved about six percentage points since making that difficult decision. Um, and that really makes a difference in the well car velocity. So that's a long-winded answer to say, we've got to fix the macro issue of velocity to address the well car availability for our intermodal containers that then cuts down on the miss outs that people are seeing on the intermodal space. So um, the other thing I think that we are doing and owing the, the, um, the, the collective marketplace is um, you know we're investing, and I, I'm sure there's other questions I can go into, but we're investing a lot of money in 2021, um, 13 different capital projects all throughout our different um, terminals to increase the parking capacity, to increase the working track, to make us more um, you know efficient and redundant in our systems and processes so we can handle the fact that things aren't working perfectly right now. So that's you know just two examples of things that we are doing to own our part, to have well cars available. There's enough well cars. They're not moving as fast as possible. Once they move faster, we'll be able to do our part. Uh, we're just, again, looking for the, the street to turn it so we can all move more product through the collective supply chain. Starting that velocity is certainly key. Yep. Jeff, walk us through some of the current trends you're seeing as it relates to container capacity and network balancing. Well, relative to the COC logistics, uh, you know, we're the bots in the middle and work with BNSF and, and certainly support Coyote and all the IMCs out there. Uh, we currently have capacity in most markets. The last half of 20, uh, we got real close to 98 to 99% uh, utilization. 
most of 21, we were less than 2% utilization. And we're seeing 7 to to 9% availability now. So we are seeing uh, some, some slowdown uh, across uh, our demand network. We are adding 5,500 containers this year and another 1,500, which will take us to roughly 10,500. Um, our intent is to add 10,000 containers between 2024 and 2028. To balance our network, we have a great mix of long-term committed business along with spot pricing levers that help us balance our surplus markets. So it's a constant review uh, and, and weekly decision um, where we uh, look to balance our markets. Okay, Luke, walk us through what you're seeing in terms of current trends on container capacity and network balancing. You know, certainly we have seen some velocity come back in and, and for kind of perspective, I, I think in the most challenging times of last year, what we saw was about five days from pickup to uh, the container being empty added to execution. And that was, um, you know, delays at shipping uh, due to the shipper challenges, um, you know, getting uh, boxes out uh, on the rail, some transit with velocity being slowed down, um, and then challenges at the destination with regard to whether it's wheels or congestion uh, at that destination terminal. Um, and then, uh, again, challenges at the constant E with regard to labor. So at the, at the most challenging times, we saw five days get added into kind of velocity on, on any asset. And I think that plays into what Jeff just mentioned in terms of the kind of the, the swings that we're seeing around box velocity. Um, we are seeing that come back. Um, it hasn't returned, I would say, to normal. Um, I think we're still seeing some challenges in markets with regard to um, whether it's available capacity uh, to, to make that pick up as quickly as we'd want to see it. Um, uh, we have certainly seen execution improve um, by, by the rail, uh, both in terms of making sure that those loads get out the day of the end gate. And, you know, obviously that's a, it's a planning exercise that happens between us and, and the railroads with regard to making sure that they know what's coming. Um, and then that velocity on the road has improved. Um, and then the, I think, point that Elise made earlier around chassis getting balanced to kind of a new normal with regard to some of the population of equipment in these markets. And then the customer's done a tremendous job of, of increasing velocity at Consigny. So we're still seeing that probably more in the two days, more than we would we would like it to be to get back to normal and then start driving improvements uh, from there as we would traditionally. Um, but I think hopefully we stop using the term unprecedented as we kind of look out to this peak season. Um, yeah. For those of us that have been in the industry a while, um, you know, this is not anything we've ever seen before, obviously. And there are, um, I think, lessons that happened prior to the last two years that we brought in to problem solving. But there's just some challenges that um, we just need to kind of collaborate and face head on. And, and we've done that really over the last 18 months. And I think we're seeing a lot of fruits of that labor come together um, as we look out in the planning horizon. Um, I think our continued focus is, um, you know, again, providing that value of visibility and communication to the customer, but also making sure they understand the impact that they might be having further downstream with some inefficiencies and then working to develop a, a deeper bench with our, with our dray capacity. Um, ultimately, a lot of these inefficiencies are on the back of the driver. Uh, we're trying to create uh, a much more driver friendly experience because if we can put more velocity across their truck. Obviously that keeps them um, effective in, in uh, generating the revenue and they need to, to pay for that truck. So that's where our focus really is uh, in terms of what we can control um, is making a, a better driver experience and ultimately driving better velocity on the street with our Drake carriers. I love that. And I'm like, you, you didn't even ask me the question, Rakita, but it would be, I would be remiss if I didn't pile in on that. Absolutely. Um, I, I, you're, you're absolutely right. Kind of the driver experience, that's another thing that we tackled and saw early on of like, what can we do? What can we control within this? And we did a survey of 3,000 of drivers that go in and out of our 31 terminals day in and day out and say, what would make your life easier and better to get in and out of our ramps? Because we know if you are getting in and out faster and you have a better experience, that will help everybody. And, and shame on us for not focusing on that as soon as we did, but we are, and we are now and we did. And so um, we have gotten a whole host of real practical, simple, easy things. Hey, 
I need a bathroom. It, it wastes my time if you don't have a bathroom for me to access and I have to stop out on the interstate. Easy, simple, overnight bathrooms at all of Union Pacific Grants, right? Next, hey, you've been doing all this great construction. This is wonderful. However, I have new drivers that come in. They don't know where the red lot is when you've changed it four times. So get your visual management up to snuff so I know where to go, right? Basic, easy things, done, checked off the bit list then more in the technology space how do we get rolling gates how do i cut out the queue lines that's really where you get your efficiency so we're spending a lot of money and time and effort on getting rolling gates set up at Union pacific ramps we did san antonio this year and that cut that line down by 70 percent san antonio is not a huge ramp so we're going out next we have six more coming out this year and then the goal is to continue to get all ramps up with kind of rolling gate technology and that, if, if I'm a driver, that makes your life easier. That makes everybody, um, you know, being able to use the intermodal product more. So we're excited about that. And anybody to support driver experience, we're, we're on board. Well, you talked about driver experience. Let's talk a little bit about the driver shortage and how it's impacting drayage. Is it better or worse than truck load? I, I, I would say it's the same. I mean, the, 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 at the end of the day, um, we have we have two issues. Um, one, the I think the continuing projection that there aren't going to be enough individuals in that workforce. And then we've been talking about efficiency and effectiveness of the use of capacity in box sense and rail car sense, and I think ultimately in driver sense. And, and those are the two biggest challenges that are out there, both for over the road as well as intermodal. Um, we have seen uh, the number of drivers in the intermodal um, segment increase uh, over the last three years. Uh, mm -hmm. primarily in small carriers and quite a bit um, leaning more towards kind of international drag. Um, I think the, you know, with any good opportunity as a business person, they're, they're coming into a market that's hot. Um, I don't know that we saw a, an aggregate increase. Uh, company drivers and large fleets have been very challenged to keep their trucks uh, seated. Um, those drivers moving into a local configuration and, and working in dredge, I think ultimately kind of keeps us net net zero in, in terms of total driver population. Um, but if we can continue to take the lessons of the last couple of years and make this a more advantageous industry for individuals to find a career um, and, you know, easy entrance and then take those uh, nuisances out of their days to make them effective so they can really have a reliable uh, you know, earnings for their family, um, that's going to be the key to continuing to, to grow drivers in, in this industry. Absolutely. And how does this impact capacity pool? Um, how does owner operators at AB5, um, how does the current state impact the capacity pool? Yeah, I, I think the, you know, the, the good news is AB5 has been sitting out there for a while and, and companies have uh, put in place strategies um, to anticipate what changes are coming. And you know, California tends to be the bellwether of these types of changes. So we do see other markets that are concerns that uh, AB5 would uh, kind of trigger in, in other states. Um, mm -hmm. as California kind of finalizes their decision on this. And I don't know that we're going to get an answer um, in this session from the Supreme Court with only, uh, I guess, a week left. Uh, but we'll see if they, they're able to fit it in on the docket and then kind of tell us what's going to come next. Um, ultimately, it's about understanding your service providers, what their business model looks like, what uh, kind of plans have they put into place to make sure that they properly pass the test and, and remain a viable service provider. Um, enforcement is going to be a challenge um, as we look out to, to how they plan to enforce this. Um, but that that probably means, uh, you know, some service providers aren't going to take it as serious as they need to to plan for. And I think it really comes down to understanding who you're working with, um, asking the right questions about what they're doing to make sure that they're going to protect themselves in that environment. Um, at the end of the day, it's going to be a higher cost impact to to running those businesses. And, and like all things in the supply chain, it, it comes back out of our pockets as consumers. Absolutely. All right. So we're going to pivot a bit to talk about rail priorities. At least mm -hmm. what strategies are the class one rails taking generally as it relates to investment? And more specifically, what are UP's priorities? Yeah, I obviously can just talk to Union Pacific's position, but you know, very simple. The safest, most reliable, most efficient rail uh, is our mission and our goal. And so what does that look like right now? 
our top priority is just almost like everybody in North America getting labor, right? We have a plan to get 1,400 crews um, so we can handle everybody's freight and business in that safe, reliable manner. Um, we have about 530 employees that are going through training classes right now so they can get out and, and help us um, in areas like NorCal, think PNW, where we need them most. Mm -hmm. um, we already have 230 of those trainees that have been hired, gone through our training process, and then out and, and working in our um, in our network. And so that is that is priority number one. That allows us then to everything we just talked about, get our velocity and our on-time performance, which is what everybody should require of us and what I would demand of my, my team and our product. And then finally, um, getting through the investment that we talked about early, uh, getting through those through. Uh, so technology and those investments can be enablers for growth. Uh, we, uh, as we sit here next year, if we have a similar session next year, Union Pacific will have over 1 million more lifts into the intermodal um, infrastructure for all our customers to grow. And as my CFO asks me, well, what about these inventory levels? I'm nervous. I'm nervous. Should we be worried here? And and I really am not nervous. I'm not nervous. I'm not worried. Um, because the overall fundamental uh, need for uh, intermodal to be a viable solution for customers is going to maintain. Will things oscillate based on what we're dealing with, with fuel prices and inflation? Absolutely. But back to that agility, we will be able to be agile and provide solutions for customers um, when they need it. Okay. And what's changed over the past two years is you, it, from your perspective? So I think we all back here, you know, like, we could get uh, the amount of times we say chassis, agility, whatever, we'd all be rich. But I think we've learned lessons that what have we did, what have we done in the last two years that we're going to make better in the future? Mm -hmm. You kind of two examples um, on the international side, it was really important. We actually don't get um, the beneficial cargo owner, or the BCO information or data. It's just not something that's shared in a normal business practice like it is in the domestic portions of our business. And why does that matter? Um, when we have a container that's potentially sitting in Chicago waiting to be picked up, we could have a BCO customer call us and want to know, hey, when can I pick that up? Where are we at? It's been sitting there for a while. I want to get that. And and per maritime law, if they're not on the way bill, we can't even answer their question. Can you imagine that frustration that I want to help them so desperately bad? I want to say, here's the plan for this but I, I can't even buy the laws of what can be shared when you're on a container or not. So again, we can either deal with that or we can say and work with our ocean carriers, let's start providing that beneficial cargo information to us. So then if we need to put piles in our international business by BCO, we have that ability to do that. Hey, can we provide that information and we can be on the same team from a customer service perspective of what are we going to do? That, that's very simple, but it's 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 actually kind of even people in the transportation industry don't know that if you're not dealing with that every day. Um, and then, you know, doing things like that. And then finally, um, just remembering that agility. I think Union Pacific has shown in the last call it six months, eight months, positions that we've taken with a bloom outage, right? I mean, just when you don't need another thing to happen to our industry, you have a bloom outage that impacted all of us. Overnight, we remembered how how we used to divvy up this equipment before we had uh, all this great technology that Bloom provides, and we were back to Excel files and phone calls only. Um, and Union Pacific acted very quickly and first to say, you know what, you were all completely blocked out. We had no idea. We're going to just wave that and take that off the table so you can worry on everything else that's on your plate today. So like, those are just two examples of using technology and thinking differently and being agile and empathetic at scale to all our customers to focus on the problem of the day because there's a lot of them that we have to deal with. Well, the global economy rounded into 2022 with a sense of hope and tempered by concerns. What should shippers be expecting and how can they position their supply chains? What do you think the three to five year outlook looks like for us, Luke? Yeah, I, I mean, we're, we're certainly facing, I think, more traditional headwinds right now with regard to rising fuel costs, um, inflationary impact, and then, you know, certainly um, different pockets of uh, analysts are, are using the R word for a recession. So um, I think typically what we see is is 
transportation is a, a leading indicator if, if we are truly headed to that type of a, a scenario. Um, and that's going to create a ton of pressure for transportation managers and uh, their responsibility around procurement. Um, and as Lise mentioned earlier, we, we are now uh, a known industry in the supply chain. So I think it creates even more pressure that not only are you going to get cost pressure, but you're in the spotlight. And it's going to be really hard to keep a deep uh, bench of, of service providers um, and still protect that, that uh, you know, budgetary process. Uh, but I think that's absolutely what success is going to look like, uh, is understanding what your needs have been. And, and again, it, it might be um, non-traditional needs in, in pockets of your supply chain, understanding how you meet those challenges. And I think a shift to more uh, transit day focus rather than a mode focus Mm -hmm. um, if you're procuring and, and you're doing your traditional approach of, you know, this is my over the road provider, this is my intermodal provider, and, and you're kind of making a binary decision between those two modes, um, you're they're not going to leave enough flexibility uh, to to respond to, I think, the, the changing times that we are going to continue to experience. And that's going to be the key in, in making sure that you're working with service providers that are creating the visibility, a high level of communication bringing those exceptions to you for decision points, um, that, that's going to be the kind of success of the next three to five years for individuals that are accountable for managing transportation. Elise, how, should, how else can shippers integrate intermodal into their supply chain? So I think um, being really clear about um, what is, what's the volume, what's the, the forecasting, that knowledge of what is, is repeatable and and then balance. We've talked a lot about balance on if it can be just one way, you know, if it can be both ways, it's just easier. It's easier right now, right? So knowing what piece of freight makes most sense and keeping with it and sticking with it is probably the best thing to plan for um, rather than kind of, it's here today, it's gone tomorrow. Now we're gonna try this, now we're gonna try that. Um, if, if we've learned anything like kind of sticking with something a little bit longer so you can build and get the, get the scale and get the repeatable process set, is probably the one thing that I'd ask right now because um, it takes a while to build up this muscle memory. And then by the time that then we shift and we try something else. Right. And so, yeah. um, you know, and I, there's things coming through in the chat. I don't know if you want me to answer them or not, but I feel, but I also know we're up a time crunch. I, yeah. I, so let's, let's hit uh, one. We have a poll question. Uh, the poll question is currently, what is the biggest obstacle to converting more freight to rail? Uh, the top answers to address one unreliable transit yep. two transit is too slow or three rates aren't low enough got what a couple it? questions um at least do you see one that you want to grab for sure well the questions i'm saying i don't know if the poll if we're supposed to do the poll or not um but i do see the one that i can answer i can help somebody that wanted to know um, hey, we've we've heard a lot about the Southern California, the inland yes. empire going up, um, but what about NorCal? And that's also something that's getting talked about. Um, we're we're walking through all our different construction projects that we're doing, um, and I like I like to use the analogy. I live in Omaha in an area that's been under a capital project for the two years. It's been going on for two years. I cannot get to my daughter's school. It adds an extra 15 minutes to my commute in the morning. It's it's frustrating. It's frustrating, but I'm so excited because when that puppy's done, it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be amazing. I'm going to get to and from places. It's going to be amazing. Um, we're doing a little bit about that right now in NorCal, right? We're we're going out to the marketplace and saying, hey, Lathrop is is due for construction, and we the good news is. We're going to increase that by 50% uh, in capacity over the next 18 to 24 months. That's the good news. The bad news is it's a construction project. It's construction season out. Everybody right now knows some construction project that's annoying them. Well, this is that same analogy. It's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. We're going to have to be creative in shifting things over. Likely, we're thinking about Oakland. We're going out to the marketplace and kind of sharing that actively right now. We know that's painful. We know that's not maybe naturally where the freight wants to go. We know that, but it's all for the price of progress. And Union Pacific is putting in a lot of money and capital for the future growth. We're a long-term play, um, and this will be the benefit in the NorCal area. And then specifically on crews, like I talked about, to make it very local and very meaningful of all the hiring classes that we're doing, NorCal is, is front and center for getting the next group. So you have, call it 50 or so, um, uh, crew base that is completely targeted to go to NorCal in the next two months. 
So I have the hiring numbers, they're coming on. I mean, we're like, keep going, keep training. You're doing great. We keep you, we need you. And uh, they're going to be coming to that area specifically because we know that the NorCal has been a bit of a pinch point right now. So again, is it is it good? No. Are we doing something about it? Yes. All right. Well, thanks for the insight. And thank you to everyone for attending the Supply Chain Master Series. To meet the increasingly diverse needs of a changing world, logisticians must engage in fresh thinking and exhibit unprecedented agility. We've got two more great webinars diving deep into supply chain KPIs, the last mile shipping, so please be sure to stick around. And to watch this and all other Coyote Logistics content on demand, please access our information at visit Coyote Resource Center at resources.coyote.com. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, guys.